Hey team, welcome to um, our, oh gosh, I don't even know what kind of screencast this is. Is that our third or fourth? Anyway, welcome to another screencast. So today is going to serve as a brief introduction to cells, which is a little funny because we already looked at cells and talked a little bit about the components of cells. Um, but they're, regardless, here we go, intro to cells. But before we even talk about the components of cells or the different types of cells there are out there, there's one thing that we need to discuss. Um, and it might seem a little, a bit absurd that we even have to talk about this, um, but we have a cell theory in biology. Um, so I'm going to write that down. And the first part of that cell theory is that all living things are made up of one or more cells. So there you go. And the second part is of the cell theory is that all cells all cells Okay, here we go. All cells arise from other cells. So all first tenant, all cells, all living things are made up of cells. Ooh, I spelled made wrong. So I'm gonna add an E there. Um, all living things are made up of cells, and all cells arise from other cells. Now, you might look at this and say, hey, wait, but what about the first cell? Um, and we're not going to discuss that in great detail now, but you should know that um, those lipid bilayers that Darren talked about in his, oh, sorry, Chang, that Chang talked about in his last screencast, um, the thought that an earliest protocell would have been just a lipid membrane that surrounded some primordial goop that was somehow self-replicating. Um, later on in the year we're going to talk about theories for the um, creation or, or the, sorry, the evolution of life, um, but, uh, but not today. Okay, so all living things are made up of cells, one or more cells, all cells arise from other cells. Okay, so the cell is the fundamental unit of life, fundamental unit of life. And that's important because cells are incredibly varied. And we're going to talk about the different types of cells or the different kinds of cells that exist in the world. And so let's make a little list here. The first one, cells can exist as unicellular as well as colonial. Oh man, I spelled colonial wrong as well. Okay, watch this. Move this over here. Oh no, damn it. Oh darn. All right. Okay, there we're back. Colonial. And lastly, as multicellular. Okay, there we go. Multicellular. Okay, so a few examples of each type. Unicellular, um, I'm sure you immediately think of bacteria. We have two types of bacteria that we're going to talk about. Eubacteria and archaea, as well as some type of protists. Um, we're going to be looking at protists in the microscope um, in the next few days. So protists. And some type of fungi, actually. You know, yeast, the stuff that makes bread rise? Those are unicellular fungi. Okay, so I've added some pictures of, um, this is a bacterial cell right here. And here we got a euglena and a yeast. So, although all of these cells, these types of cells, are all unicellular, um, they're very different in terms of their simplicity or complexity. Um, so bacteria, we know, are all what? Who said prokaryotes? That's exactly right. So bacteria are examples of pro... Oh gosh. Prokaryotes, which means that they are more simple. They lack a nucleus and any endomembrane system. Um, and well, as opposed to eukaryotes over here, which have a nucleus, an endomembrane system, 
um, all that good stuff. Um, and um, additionally, eukaryotes are often much larger than prokaryotic cells. Um, I know that they look the same size here, but you should know that the bacterial cells are actually a lot smaller than both these yeast and euglena. Um, so prokaryotes smaller, less complexity, eukaryotes um, larger and more complexity. You might notice that this guy, whoop, he is green. Um, he's a really cool little protist. He not only eats things, but he also performs photosynthesis and can synthesize his own food. Um, so he's what we call a mixotroph. Um, very, very neat little protist. Okay, but these are all examples of single cell organisms. Okay, okay, so let's talk about some multicellular types of cells um, now. So, as you all know, plants and animals, so planta and animalia, as well as fungi, fungus, these types of organisms can all or all exist as multicellular organisms. Um, so we said before that fungi, like this yeast cell right here, can exist as single cells, but we all know we've seen mushrooms out in the woods and you know even in the grocery store, and those are examples of multicellular fungi. So, again here are two more examples. Here's plant. Oh no, I just erased that. A plant cell and an animal cell, in general, not complete always, but in general, as a general rule, they are larger, more complex organisms, um, also than unicellular or organisms, also colonial. Now the difference is here is that while um, yeast cells and um, these euglena little dudes um, over on the far right are very happy and um, are completely fine living on their own independently of all other cells. Plant cells and animal cells depend on um, other cells within their organism to stay alive. Okay, and here, now let me show you an example of a colonial organism. This is, I'm gonna put it over here. This is an example of what's called a volvox. These dudes are absolutely gorgeous. Um, they are, as you can imagine, um, photosynthetic organisms, that's why they're green, total chlorophyll, and each of these little things right here, this is the nucleus of one cell, and here's a nucleus of another cell, and they're so, the cell membranes here are not stained, so you can't really see the differences in between, but if we could, I could even more finely gradate my line, which I don't know how to do. Um, you would see that there are cell membranes that are surrounding each of these nuclei. And actually in the middle of the cells here, all these little guys are going to be essentially the offspring of, of this volvox right here. Um, this organism is going to open up and um, let out these little little baby volvox right here that it's that it's kind of grown up. So now you might ask, well, what's the difference between a multicellular organism like our plants and our animal cells right here and a colonial organism like Volvox that looks very similar? And the answer actually is that in Volvox, all these cells that make up oop, the Volvox dude are all the same. So this cell right here, ooh, I have a pointer, I wonder if this works. This cell right here, and this cell right here, and this cell right here are all exactly identical cells. Whereas in a plant or an animal, you know that's not the case. You have your skin cells and your liver cells and your red blood cells. So you have differentiation of your cells, all different types of, of cells making up one organism. Um, yes. Okay, so here we go. We know our cell theory. All living things are made up of cells. Cells arise from other cells. We've got a bunch of different types of cells. Um, and now let's talk really briefly about the stuff that cells are made of. Now, you know from your inquiries on the web that cells are composed of organelles. Ooh, what just happened there? I'm going to erase that. Awesome. So cells are made up of organelles. And cells are also made up of structures. 
Well, you might ask yourself, what's the difference between an organelle and a structure? And I'm going to tell you that organelles are all membrane bound. Membrane bound. And structures are not membrane bound. Okay, so structures are not surrounded by a membrane. And I think you can point to a few organelles that we've talked about. For example, the ER would be an example of a membrane bound organelle, and a structure, a ribosome. Not made up of the membrane. Um, okay, so which leads us to our final point, which is to discuss the number one goal of a cell. Well, the number one goal of a cell is to survive and reproduce, but let's say the primary goal of a cell during its lifetime is to produce protein. And so the screencast that you guys are creating um, is helping you understand how the cells go through this really, really important process of producing protein. Because cells are basically like little protein factories. They're reading their DNA, they're decoding it, um, transcribing it into RNA, and then um, translating it into protein. And that process is very complicated, but also very important. So, thinking of cells as protein-making machines. Okay, I believe that is it. Um, thanks for watching, and I will see you all in class tomorrow.